Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for taking time to come to this session. Uh, uh, we have with us today uh, for this ASN fireside chat, uh, number 1118, uh, uh, Dr. Tushar uh, Suryakant Malwadi, a very good friend uh, from the University of Toronto. Uh, Dr. Malwadi finished his residency and specialization, including nephrology training in India. Uh, then moved to Canada as a clinical fellow, recertified with specialty training and subspecialization training in internal medicine, nephrology uh, at the University of Toronto. And in addition, did his renal transplant fellowship and home dialysis fellowship. Uh, that's really an accomplishment of Tushar. Uh, and later on, went on to do a master's in teaching. Uh, Dr. Tushar now is assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of Toronto and a consultant nephrologist in the University Health Network. This is the largest uh, uh, hospital uh, you know, uh, chain in, in, in Canada, Toronto, Canada, and across Canada, I would say the largest center. He's a clinician teacher and teaches students at the undergraduate level, graduate level, internal medicine residents, nephrology trainees, and home dialysis fellows. He manages patients with end-stage renal disease and peritoneal dialysis, which is specialty. Uh, he also sees general nephrology. His general nephrology practice consists of CKD patients, a special interest in sickle cell anemia with renal disease, uh, cardiorenal patients with advanced heart failure. So this is his, uh, his special uh, specializations. Uh, so you can see he's really well accomplished. And, and thank you very much, Dr. Kushar, for taking on today, um, telling us about taking care of your patient with non-dialysis chronic kidney disease, which is very relevant in our in our situation. Thank you. Over to you, Tushar. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dr. Vincent and the team here to invite me for this uh, uh, topic. This is a pretty uh, common topic, and uh, I hope that it benefits you. Uh, there are a lot of stuff that uh, is there in the chronic kidney disease, whether it's like 45 minutes or one hour is not sufficient, actually, to cover all the aspects of it. So I asked Vince, uh, Lloyd what uh, topics would he like me to cover and he said that better give the cases. So what we will do is uh, we'll try to do a little bit of CKD and then we'll go to the cases and then from the cases we'll try to uh, see what are the nuances. Okay? Uh, please uh, let me know if you have any questions and I'm happy to answer the questions. Again as I mentioned it's a huge topic. I'll try to uh, be a little bit fast but please uh, interrupt me if you uh, want to uh, have any clarification. So moving on, agenda for today is um, I'll be doing about uh, talking about CKD. What is the definition, the epidemiology, the pathophysiology, what happens inside the kidney, the risk factors, symptoms, monitoring progression, how to retard the progression. And lastly, we'll do the cases. The cases are the major part, uh, the 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 CKD, that main section is only a small part. So now let's define what is uh, CKD. So CKD is defined as an abnormality of the kidney structure or function. So you, you may not have an abnormality of the uh, structure, but if the patient has say proteinuria or a persistent hematuria, which is from the kidneys, then you define that patient as having um, uh, CKD, even if the patient has a normal kidney function. Now that abnormality which persists for more than three months and it has its implications on the health then you define it okay and how do you diagnose what are the markers of the kidney damage the markers of the kidney damage is basically albinuria which is more than 30 milligrams in 24 hours in uh, that is uacr of 30 milligrams more than a gram or more than three milligram per millimole i understand that um, in africa you, uh, creatinine is in terms of micromoles, so this is what we usually follow. I, we also follow this in Canada. The other markers are urine sediment uh, abnormalities, like um, if the patient has persistent hematuria or other stuff, or electrolyte abnormalities such as like acidosis or hyperkalemia, or abnormalities detected from the histology. That means the patient is having now structural abnormalities, or you can detect it by imaging studies like ultrasound or CT scan. When the patient has a history of kidney transplant, it automatically becomes a CKD. As you can see in this, there is no definition of a GFR. But in the older days, they used to say that a patient with a GFR less than 60 used to qualify for CKD. But now we have realized that more than 60 also can have CKD. So now, coming to the epidemiology, 
I Googled out and I went to this book and it had a nice section about what are the major causes of CKD in Africa. Almost these studies have been shown from uh, across Africa and especially the studies are from sub-Saharan countries as well. And the major causes is of CKD is hypertension, diabetes, glomerulonephritis, infection, HIV, cystosomiasis or HBV and sickle cell disease. Now in in North America, the most common cause is diabetes. Here, as we see it in Africa, it's hypertension. Now, this all, if the patient has a genetic background with a high prevalence of ApoL1 variants, it becomes more uh, kind of a uh, uh, background. And then uh, if you get these diseases, then the disease progresses faster. So it's like a kind of a one hit and a two hit kind of a uh, theory. Now, coming to how do we stage a CKD? Now, as you can see, we have got this cube. Uh, we got one, one is, as you can see, uh, this A1, A2, and A3. This is nothing but your albinuria. It is less than 30 milligrams, 30 to 300 milligrams, and more than 300 milligrams. So that's ACR less than 3, 3 to 30, and A3 is more than 30. That's your this bar. Then you have the vertical axis is the staging. The staging is more than 90 then 60 to 90, then stage two, that is stage 3A is 45 to 59, stage 3B is 30 to 44, stage four is 15 to 29, and stage five is less than 15, okay? But we can see that, so we have got two axes here. One is this axis, one is this axis, but there's another axis which is here, which tells you about the etiology of the kidney disease. Now, this is particularly important so as to understand how, and each kidney disease would behave. If you have got a cystic and congenital diseases as compared to glomerular diseases, this kidney diseases, they would progress, but at a much slower rate as compared to glomerular diseases, which are at a much higher rate. So that's why we have got these three, three distinct types. For usually in KDGO, they are mentioned about A1, A2, A3, and G1, G2, G3, G4, and G5. Now, understanding, does it really matter of what stage or the patient at what age the patient has a CKD. So as you can see on this, there's a hazard ratio of adverse outcomes associated with EGFR by the age. Now, as you on the x-axis, you've got the EGFR. On the y-axis is the adjusted heart hazard ratio for ESRD. Now you can see the different colors like green, black, blue, and red are for different different ages. So what we are seeing is a common theme as like, as we go lesser and lesser in the GFR, no matter what, your kidneys will progress to have CKD, okay? So even if the patient is like say 80 or 85 and the GFR is 20, if that patient survives longer enough, that kidneys will definitely have a loss in the GFR. Now, coming to what abnormalities come at what stage of CKD, okay? So this is a graph which shows that. Now, again, on the x-axis, you've got the GFR. On the y-axis is the adjusted odds ratio. And the different colors is anemia, acidosis, hyperphosphatemia, hypocalcemia, hyperpartisan, hyperkalemia. So as we can see, they're all okay. And at one point after 60, you start getting the major abnormalities. So usually after the GFR of 60 and below, you start getting all these complications of CKD, which we all know, which are this uh, as listed here. Now, briefly talking about what happens to the pathophysiology. So what happens when the patient has loss in the kidney function? So basically, as we have loss in the kidney function, the, there's something known as single nephron theory. That means if a glomerulus is damaged, the tubule gets uh, uh, degenerated. If the tubule is damaged, the glomerulus is degenerated. So when the functional unit, that is our nephron, gets uh, damaged, so that it becomes uh, the, the, the work of filtration is done by other nephrons. And that's why it increases their work and it causes hyperfiltration. So what happens is when you have a decreased mass in the kidney, the functioning nephrons go down. The ones which are functioning, they get a glomerular hypertension. And that because of the glomerular hypertension, they got mechanical straining. So what does this mechanical straining mean? Means as you know, this is the, photocyte and these are the foot processes and there's a basement membrane inside which is like causing this kind of a thing. The basement membrane starts out pouching between them and that causes the damage. 
And we know that this is majority time have been mediated by the angiotensin 1 uh, receptor and angiotensin 2 are up regulated. So that's why there's a rational of using the RAS blockage in patient for uh, CKD. When you have glomerular hypertension, it causes high mechanical strain. It actually increases the pore dimension, causes more proteinuria, and then causes disease progression. So this is in a nutshell what happens. I usually tell the patients this way just to make sure like if they understand it easily. Like um, when you have a decrease in the nephrons, the kidneys will get damaged. The, the example that I tell them is like if they have a factory of 100 workers and they put out a X amount of a product, whatever it is the product. If I remove 50 workers and I tell them that they have to maintain the same amount of uh, output that is X amount. So the remaining 50 workers, they'll work twice hard to maintain that output. Now, because they are working twice hard, they will have a wear and tear. So if it takes 10 years to take from, uh, it may take like 10 years to go down from 50 workers to 40 workers. When they're remaining with 40 workers, they're working two and a half times of what they were originally working to maintain the same output of X. And so because they're working two and a half times, if they took 10 years to come from uh, 50 to 40, they'll take five years to come from 40 to 30. And when they're at 30 workers remaining, they are working more than three times of what they're working. So when if it took 10 years to come from 40, 50 to 40, five years from 40 to 30, it may take only three years to come from 30 to 20. And when they're working at 20%, the workers that is our nephrons is basically they're working five times. So there's an exponential damage which happens and there's a loss of the renal function. So exactly this is what I told the patients and they seem to understand this. This is what happens. The, nothing, the, the output is nothing but the weight of the body. If you increase the weight, the workers get more damage. The workers are nothing but the nephrons. So that's an uh, example I give the patients and they feel, uh, they feel comfortable understanding because it's not something a uh, medical jargon. Now, what happens when you have got a progressive glomerular injury? So you've got glomerular disease, you've got a nephron loss, you get glomerular capillary hypertension, it causes mechanical stretching, it causes mesangial cells, endothelial cells, protocytes, all cause prop have under strain. It actually causes more matrix deposition and causes glomerular sclerosis. It, it is a reaction to the mechanical stretching, but also it sets off a cascade in which there's an inflammation and there's an inflammation, as you know, ends up with the scarring of the kidney. And this is what happens when the glomerular sclerosis happen. And then there's an increasing proteinuria. So now, I, I did not show the slide of what, what happens in the tubules, but also similar things happen in the tubules. Tubules, because they're hyperfiltering, they have high, absorbing more amount of protein and they get damaged because of the protein absorption as well. Okay. Coming to the next slide, this is the risk factors for chronic kidney disease. As you can see, it's a busy slide, sorry for that, but I wanted to put them all in together. Age. Now, age, old age causes more CKD, but less progression of ESRD. The reason is because pretty simple. The formulas for our GFR calculation have got age in the denominator. So when you have the age in the denominator, the GFR will be always shown less. Now, so that's why you'll get patients with the age of 52, which will maybe appropriate for that age of 90, but we still call them as CKD. But if you get a younger age, if you get CKD in younger age, it's true. And that's why they have less CKD, but if they get CKD, they will progress to the ESRD. As come to men, women have a higher risk of, higher risk of incident CKD, but lower risk of pro, uh, progression. But men, if they get CKD, they have higher risk of progression. Uh, patients from African heritage have lower incidence of mild CKD, but a high prevalence of ESRD. What does that mean? That means they will get more amount of uh, ESRD if they get CKD, but otherwise the prevalence of CKD is quite less. Now this one, this uh, study was taken from uh, in Americas. Genes, one is ApoL1, then you also know about the sickle cell trait. And as I mentioned, the gene prevalence in this population was uh, in the US, African American was 7 to 13%. Uh, Roughly in Africa also, the apoel one was around 13%. Now the social determinants are lower social economic status, have a face a greater burden of CKD. It's because they are not able to take care of themselves, there's medication supply, whether they are able to afford the therapies or the doctors. Then comes our comorbid conditions like diabetes, hypertension, obesity. 
And there are certain things like elevated uric acid and elevated serum osmolarity are also been associated with development of the CKD. Now, coming to how do you evaluate a CKD and monitoring? We don't, it's no brainer. It's basically when you are seeing a patient with CKD, you basically do a job as what we should be doing as a, as a core internist. What we do is we evaluate them and we try to find out what is the etiology of the CKD because as I mentioned, different etiologies will have a different rate of progression. One, then you know, you should know what is a GFR because then your attitude of thinking <laughs> means your change, like your ideas change. If the GFR is like 15, that's different as compared to a GFR of 50. Then you should know how much is the albinuria or proteinuria because as you know, there are different guidelines for patients with proteinuria and without proteinuria. Also about the imaging like whether the patient has any post renal, if the patient has one kidney, if one kidney is small, if the patient has a bigger kidneys or hydronephrotic kidney or multiple cysts or there's a cancer there. If the patient has anything to suggest glomerulonephritis like hematuria or uh, proteinuria or there's active sed sediments or like uh, anything which lights up on the autoimmune panel like C3, C4, ANA, then you need to get a uh, GN workup and sometimes uh, you have to do a renal biopsy. If you don't know what is the cause of the CKD, you may have to do a renal biopsy to establish the cause. Now the biopsy here not only tells you what is the cause of the CKD, but also tells you about the prognosis. It depends on how much is the percentage of um, a, a tubular atrophy or interstitial fibrosis there. Now this is for establishing the etiology and also what is the current stage in which the patient sees you. Once you have diagnosed that the patient has CKD, then you go for the complication. And the complications that you monitor are basically anemia, CDC, lights is for the potassium, bicarb is for acidosis, calcium profile is for hypocalcemia or hypercalcemia, hyperphosphatemia, that's for uh, calcium profile. PTH, because we know that PTH goes high as with the secret stages progress, vitamin D deficiency or whether the patient has uh, adequate vitamin D, and then proteinuria. Coming to the management of CKD, basically what is really essential, which is not stressed, is the non-pharmacological management. The diet is the first thing. Now the diet, we should advise the patient to take almost like a salt-restricted diet. Now it depends on what kind of CKD it is, obviously. If the patient has a salt-wasting nephropathy, there's no point in uh, restricting the salt. But usually, as the patient starts getting more hypertensive or starts having edema, that means salt and water retention, you want to restrict the salt diet. Now you patients may not understand where the salt comes from. Uh, salt can come in hidden forms as well. They may say that I may not add the salt to the food, but they may add salt when they're making the food. A lot of salt can is added. Sometimes they add it to the rice, sometimes they add it to the bread. What we usually tell the patients is like, we should try to curtail the salt to less than five grams of salt. Now, mind you, salt is five grams and sodium is two grams. So it's a very different thing because 40% of salt is sodium. So it's basically 40% of two grams salt is two, 40% uh, uh, of five grams salt is two grams sodium. How much protein should, should they take? So there have been various studies which have been shown. The most important study that we really follow is the MDRD, that is modified diet in the renal disease, in which we found out like 0.6 to 0.8 grams per kg per day is an adequate amount of protein to retard the progression or slowing the progression if you have a GFR between 25 to 75. So what we should ask the patient is take your proteins adequately. Do not start the day with the protein and end with the day of the protein. But there's something if we can measure that would be good. Now potassium restriction, we don't restrict potassium for everyone, but only if the patient has hyperkalemia and you know that the patient has a uh, advanced renal failure or the patient is on RAS blockers and you want to do the RAS blocker. So that's why you want to restrict the potassium. So you educate the patients on high potassium diet. Now, phosphate restriction again, when the patient has hyperphosphatemia. Needless to say, the patient should exercise. Weight loss is always beneficial, not only for the kidneys, but also the heart and the bones. As I mentioned, that extra weight is nothing but extra uh, strain on the kidneys and it just encourages the secondary FSGS. Alcohol intake has initially days, they, we never had any problems with the alcohol, but nowadays the studies have shown that alcohol intake does increase the progression rate for CKD. That's why they should curtail the alcohol intake. Illicit drugs, basically these are cocaine and other stuff. 
they shouldn't be taken because we never know whether uh, they are laced with something or not. So certain drugs like cocaine or uh, cannabis, they increase the sympathetic drive and they can actually cause more hypertension. And that's why it may be, it should be controlled. And the last is avoid acute and chronic kidney disease is basically telling do not get dehydrated or at the same time do not get overhydrated. Avoid certain things like uh, NSAIDs or any other uh, medications which can cause A on C. Now coming to the pharmacological management, as I mentioned, the complications that we see is anemia. So you give iron or erythropoiesis stimulating agents. The third uh, agent is hypoxia, inducible factor, which I'm not mentioning here. Even in the next case, I'll mention, but it's not uh, uh, practiced openly. So that's why I'm not going to talk about that. Antiproteinuria therapy is the main backbone for the therapy. What is the antiproteinuria therapy? Is nothing but RAS blockers, nowadays SGLT2 inhibitors, non dihydropyridine calcium canal blockers, which is nothing but diltiazem and verapamil. Now, usually these medications, they are weak antiproteinuria therapy, but they can add up as for an add on therapy for when you're, you cannot use much of RAS blockers. Antihypertensive therapy. Uh, we will go through this again in the next case. In the target BP, the target blood pressure for CKD population varies from where you are. Okay? So different, different guidelines will mention different, different targets. But the more global is our KDGO guidelines. And we follow that KDGO guidelines. The KDGO guidelines used to be 140-90 and 130-80, non-diabetic or diabetic. But they have recently changed in 2021. And they have actually made it even more stricter to make it less than 120. So we'll go over that as well. Then metabolic acidosis. Now metabolic acidosis happens because the kidneys are not able to excrete the acid. They're not able to regenerate the bicarb and the patient eats proteins. Proteins are the source of acids. So what happens is when you have metabolic acidosis, you get hyperkalemia and you can also have more deteriorating deterioration in the renal function because a complement activation is there. The other thing is you get renal osteo dystrophy. Prevent metabolic acidosis, you supplement by giving bicarb, and the target bicarb is 22. So, we, if the bicarb is less than 22, we try to bring it by giving sodium bicarb or giving with, or the baking soda. The other is hyperkalemia. So, it depends on how you want to manage the hyperkalemia. We have one case, then later on, dyslipidemia. Now, dyslipidemia, um, as you know, there have been studies like 4D, Aurora uh, study, and Nothing much has been shown to be positive in dialysis, but we definitely know for patients who are non-dialysis CKD population, they are considered a high risk. And that's why nowadays, KDGO is suggesting that we should start the patients on uh, statins because they are high risk for coronary artery disease. The drugs, as I mentioned, we should stop all medications which are not necessary. Like patients may be taking vitamin D 4,000 units, not needed. Patient may be taking aspartic acid, not needed. So unnecessary medication should be stopped. They should be educated not to take any NSAIDs like uh, ibuprofen or uh, naproxen or diclofenac. The other medications are uh, simple vitamins. We should not bombard them with this my, uh, uh, medications because they may miss out on the important medications and rather leave the important medications and take the ones which are not essential. So we have to be careful about medication prescription in patients with uh, CKD. Okay, uh, I can, I'll give you uh, any questions, anyone. I'm going to the cases now. I see that there is one uh, chat. What can explain the transient increase in GFR in 90 plus age as displayed in the figure? These are all um, uh, 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 epidemiological studies. As you can see that there might be one or two patients only which have been noted with the GFR of 90 plus. Otherwise, there are nothing to suggest. This is just a curve which came up. It's one of the statistical things. That uh, that one, uh, yeah, sorry. Anyone, any other questions? So we have a 67-year-old male with type 2 diabetes mellitus since last 16 years, along with diabetic retinopathy and hypertension. His current list includes hydrochlorothiazide, 25 milligrams daily, uh, metoprolol, 25 milligrams BID, metformin, 1,000 milligrams uh, BID. He's on examination, he has uh, edema in his legs. His blood pressure is elevated 168 by 88. Rest of the examination is unremarkable. His serum creatinine is 200 and the ACR is 256. 
he comes to your nephrology clinic and asks you about the disease progression and the risk of other comorbidities. What do you say is true? So the first option is he will need renal replacement therapy in the next 15 years. Um, very difficult to say that then. He will need renal replacement therapy in the next few months. Again, very difficult to say that. His risk of coronary artery disease is same as the general population. Definitely not. This is not the answer. The ACR of 256 places him at high risk of security progression. So as you can see, like uh, we can, this is a very high risk. Like he has got diabetes, 16 years. He's got uh, diabetic retinopathy, hypertension. The hypertension is uncontrolled. He's on a diuretic, beta blocker, metformin, and uh, he's uh, ACR is 256. So obviously he will need renal replacement therapy in the next little while, but not 15 years. The need renal replacement in the next few months is also not appropriate. What we do use is a formula known as kidney failure risk equation, and that will tell us what is the risk of the patient needing dialysis in the next two years and five years. So if you want, I can share that formula. It's, or you can Google it out as well. His risk of coronary artery disease is same as the general population, definitely not. And ACR of 256 places them at high risk of CKD progression. Mm, this is something which probably is true. So let's see what is the importance of the ACR. So now we got a relationship between the baseline protein and the subsequent decline in the GFR. So as you can see on the X, this is a whisker plot. As you can see, we have got three categories, less than one gram, one to three grams, and more than three grams. And on the Y axis, we got the GFR decline. So when you have a, a protein area of almost like a gram or less, the GFR decline is almost like 1.5. So mind you, the normal GFR decline is almost 1 ml per year after the age of 40. But if you have got any proteinuria, it will start declining. Okay. When you have between 1 to 3 grams, it's almost like 5 ml per year. But if you have got more than 3 grams, that is a nephrotic syndrome, you're going to lose almost like 8 to 10, gram, 8 to 10 ml. So even if this gentleman had a GFR of 20, and if the patient has a high amount of protein, he's going to lose his renal function quite fast. So it's not like we cannot say that, oh, it's, you're stable, that's why I don't worry. So there will be a decline in the renal function very fast. So he has a very high risk of secondary progression. Now, coming to how bad the proteinuria and what is the adverse event, not, uh, not the kidneys, but all-cause mortality and uh, uh, as per the GFR and the albinuria. So this is the albinuria. So if you see on this graph, we got the x-axis as the ACR milligram per gram and the adjusted hazard ratio for the all-cause mortality and cardiovascular mortality. So as you see, as you grow up, go up, up, up on the protein area, your hazard ratio for the cardiovascular mortality also increases. Okay, so that's really so uh, important to understand. Now, why does this happen? Because Albinuria is nothing but a marker of endothelial dysfunction. And that's why it really essentially boils down that when you have albinuria, that means the patient has endothelial dysfunction all over the body. Now, coming to the GFR, what happens to the GFR as you go down? So as you can see on the x-axis, you have the GFR and on the y-axis is the adjusted hazard ratio. So as the GFR goes down, the all-cause mortality and the cardiovascular mortality goes higher and higher and higher. So this is, as we know, as the GF, uh, higher stage of CKD is higher cause of mortality as well as cardiovascular mortality. Now coming to why would this happen in, especially with the cardiovascular. So why does a patient with CKD have cardiovascular disease? Now, as we know, in cardiovascular disease, we always typify a patient by the risk. The modifiable risk that is a traditional uh, the uh, and the non-modifiable or traditional risk factors and non-traditional uh, non risk factors. So in patients with CKD, as you can see, if you have no CKD as compared to as you advance to the stages of CKD, you get this typical things which is atherosclerotic cardiovascular events, coronary artery disease, stroke or peripheral artery disease. But as you progress, what we don't see is the other big factors which are non usually traditionals. And what we get here are at non atherosclerotic CVD, that is cardiovascular disease, left ventricular hypertrophy, arrhythmia, sudden cardiac death, arterial calcification, wall calcification, hemorrhagic stroke others. And look at this, the risk of death 
increases as you go higher. So this is not something which we don't know, but we have to understand that it's not a simple coronary artery disease which is going to cause a problem, but there's a lot of other stuff which is non-coronary artery disease can also cause a problem which are going to contribute for cardiovascular death in patients with CKD. Now, coming to the what causes the problems with the arteries. Now, as we know, there are the traditional risk factors of age, gender, hypertension, smoking, LVH, and death. But there are a lot of non-traditional risk factors. So what are non-traditional risk factors? These are the traditional. If you have any other risk factors which are not a part of this, then they become a non-traditional risk factors. Okay. So in CKD, as we know, we have oxidative stress, inflammation, endothelial dysfunction, anemia, scalcification. And it causes similar activation, uremic bone loss. And what happens is basically it's not uh, calcific, it, it causes atherosclerosis, definitely yes, but also it causes the calcification of the media. And that is how it contributes to the cardiovascular disease. I will be having one more slide later on to uh, tell about this. Now, telling about cardiovascular disease in CKD, how does they present? So they present like any other patient to the medicine. So they may present as acute coronary syndrome, peripheral arterial disease, stroke, atrial fibrillation, uh, uh, heart failure, pericarditis, autonomic dysfunction, valvular disease, infectivity. So basically, this is all that we get in our medicine population is the same thing that our current disease patients will get and they present. The problem is the evaluation. Now, why, am, why do I say it's a problem? Because patients, because it's the inertia from the doctors to how, to, how much to evaluate or how much not to evaluate. If someone says you have got CKD and you have got a cardiologist, uh, we have a, 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 a tries into troponins, do you want a coronary angiography? Oh, the creatine will get the hit. I, I better not use a coronary angiogram. Let me do a non-intrusive uh, uh, non, um, management. That is the evaluation part. And that is where we should be changing our attitude because patients with CKD will also need the appropriate care as, well, as much as a non-CKD patient also, a non-CKD non -patient, non patient gets. So how do you prevent? How do you treat and prevent the cardiovascular disease? It's basically the same stuff. It's basically you need to be healthy, stop smoking, do not gain more weight, low salt in the diet, control your hypertension and diabetes, uh, take, make sure that you don't have dyslipidemia. In terms of volume, make sure that you're not volume overloaded or under volume. That means intraoscular depleted or or If the patient has anemia, like in hemoglobin of 70s and 80s, make sure it is around 100. Inflammation, is when the patient is having uh, too much of malnutrition or there's anything like a wound, like a perif uh, peripheral arterial disease, make sure that you take care of it. Mineral bone disease is nothing but your calcium and phosphate uh, taken care. Revascularization should be done the same way as any other patient does, okay? What is more important is, as you know, like the contrast nowadays, th there's a, about the contrast in this nephropathy, there's a thought whether it's a really a true entity or not, but we should be revascularization if the patient has any problems with the coronary artery disease, we should definitely go for revascularization because that actually shows that the heart function will improve, the patient will be better that way. Okay, so now coming back to a case, what is important is his risk of coronary artery disease is the same as general disease is strong. This all, both things are wrong. So the answer is ACR of 256 places him at a higher risk of CKD progression. So that's a, uh, that's a true thing. Case number two, a 50 senior female with CKD secondary to hypertension nephrosclerosis, so she has got hypertension. On BP, her blood pressure is 170 by 100. Heart rate is 88. Uh, I didn't mention the uh, great, uh, uh, anything else, but she, she is on hydrochlorothiazide 12.5 mg daily and amlodipine 5 daily. So she's only on two agents. Creatine is 150 with an EGF of 38. So she's stage 3B and ACR is 12. That means A2. Which of the following is true? Now, the target blood pressure is less than 120 by 80. The target blood pressure is less than 140 by 90. The target blood pressure is less than 130 by 80. Or you should, because the blood pressure is uncontrolled, add furosemide to the amlodipine and hydrochlorothiazide. I'd give a few seconds for you to think. Okay, so moving on. As you know, we have different, different committees and different, different uh, countries have different, different guidelines. Like, uh, UK has NICE, then there are ERA, EDTA for Europe. In, Af in America, there is KDOCI, 
overall it is k digo so now coming to k digo guidelines oh this didn't show properly the k digo guidelines is here it was it came in 2021 and it has a blood pressure management in patients with ckd with or without diabetes not receiving the dialysis so this is our population with or without diabetes is very important because earlier we used to classify CKD with diabetes and CKD without diabetes. And their level one recommendation is in patients with adults with high blood pressure and CKD be treated with target systolic of less than 120 when tolerated using standardized office blood pressure measurement. So this is important because it really changed the targets. Okay, And if you see what is you are seeing is recommend start RAS uh, for people with high BP, see whether increase albinuria without diabetes. So non-diabetic CKD, non CKD with albinuria use RAS. Yes, we know. Suggest so starting RAS inhibitors for high BP, CKD and moderately increase albinuria. So, so this is A2. Uh, this is like 30 to, uh, uh, 3 to 30. And they also suggest that they recommend start using RAS for patients with high BP, CKD and moderate to severe increase with diabetes. So what you're understanding is RAS is coming again and again. And then the last says, we recommend avoiding any combination of ACE inhibitors and ARB. Yes, we, we also know that because of the risk of hyperkalemia and the AKI. So now, this target of systolic of less than 120, where did it come from? It came from the SPRINT trial, which was published in 2015, as we know. And SPRINT trial definitely showed that once you are aggressively controlling the blood pressure above 75 years of age, then you will have lesser incidence of cardiovascular events and mortality. So why did it come to us in security? Well, because those uh, the patients with CKD are thought to be at high risk of coronary artery disease or uh, cardiovascular events. That's why they started using the target of less than 120. But there are some caveats. Which patients will not be uh, eligible for that stage uh, uh, CKD? At one stage, uh, CKD stage 4 and 5. Depends on what you have. Type 2 diabetes. Systolic blood pressure between 120 and 130. Why is this? Because some of the targets are between one, less than 120, some of the targets are less than 130. We don't know what happens between 120 and 130. If you have a diastolic blood pressure less than 50, as you know, when you go lesser on the diastolic blood pressure, your coronary perfusion hampers. That's why we don't want anyone to go below less than 50. Albinuria, as you mentioned there, if the patient has albinuria, what is the target? Earlier, it used to be like less than 130 or more. There used to be like something else, so 125, 75 in the past, about 15 years back, but that has also gone now. If the patient has severe hypertension, more than 180 by 100 on one antihypertensive medication, or else less than 50 or more than 90 years of age, because this is the place where the sprint trial was taken. And frailty. So if the patient is frail, there's no point in bringing the blood pressure down to less than 120. We don't want the patient to fall. What happens is, when you try to target this blood pressure 120, you know that you're going to have more problems. It all depends on where you are comfortable and the patient is comfortable. Sometimes if the patient is having trouble with a blood pressure less than 120, if he's getting lighted or dizziness, you take it, you just discount it and let it be around more than 120 then. Okay, so these are the different different guidelines and gold blood pressure thresholds for different society guidelines according to underlying uh, comorbidities. As you can see, we have got the American College of Cardiology. This is European. This is the Canadian. This is Australian. This is Japanese. This is UK. What we have here is CKD. As you can see, the KDGO was less than 120 by 80. American was 130 by 80. 130 by 80 in uh, European as well. Canadians are 120 by 80. So the what we are trying to say now is 120 by 80 is our target. So the hypertension in this patient, what of the following is true? It again is depends on which guideline you follow. If you follow at KDGO, which is more global, then the target is less than 120 by 80. Okay, as per the KDGO, Australian and CHEP guidelines, as I've shown. Coming to case three, 74 year male with hypertension, myocardial infarction, HFREF, uh, 25% EF. Chronic kidney disease and the creatinine is 200, the EGF of 32, and ACR of 88. He's on ramipril, metoprolol, hydrolazine, isosorbid dinitrogen, and aspirin. Now, what can you do to retard the progression of the CKD? Okay. So now, as we know, there are some certain risk factors here. The risk factor is the patient has cardiac failure. So this is going to have cardiac renal syndrome. 
The patient also has hypertension and myocardial infarction. So that means he must be having underlying uh, ischemic nephropathy, that is hypertension nephrosclerosis. And you don't know, but how does it play out? But the other important thing is he has an ACR of 88. So he has a lot of proteinuria. Now, now this is non-diabetic proteinuria. How do you manage this? So the, this question, this case is going to answer that. So we know that uh, we have albuminuria reduction with RAS blockers like ACE inhibitors or ARBs and also the SGLT2 inhibitors. Now, what is the what are uh, SGLT2 inhibitors? Then we have GLP-1 uh, receptor analogs, and then lastly is nothing but mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, which is phenylalanine. Now, out of this, because of the time, I'll just talk about the SGLT2 inhibitors because that is the most uh, in thing now, and there are a lot of studies which have come up. So, SGLT2 inhibitors are three, as we know, canagliflozin, dapagliflozin, and pagliflozin. Earlier, they came up as only for diabetics, but now we have a lot of data to suggest that these are very, very nice and have favorable ease effects on non-diabetics as well. The mechanism of action is they decrease the hyperfiltration by causing vasoconstriction at the afferent and vasodilatation at the efferent level of the glomerulus. After you start this medication, the GFR goes down to four by five in two to three weeks, but uh, you allow it to happen and you know that this is going to happen. It's sim similar to the way that RAS blockers also act. But if the GFR decreases more than 30%, you have to literally withdraw it. So this is the same thing as we do for the RAS also. So now, how did this SGLD2 inhibitors change the landscape? So in 2015, we got the Empire trial. In 2017, we had the Canvas trial. And then this was all for your cardiovascular disease. But then started coming over kidney diseases like Credence, DAPAP, HF, Declare. And then we have this evidence, which is the most recent evidence, which is the Empa kidney. So now, coming to the Credence trial, what does the Credence trial tell you? So mind you, Credence was only diabetic patients, okay? They had uh, 100 patients, uh, almost like uh, uh, some, uh, some, uh, something around 4,000 patients. Diabetic EGF was 30 to 90, albuminuria was 300 to 5 grams, and 4,000 patients. So sorry for this, but um, uh, I hope you can see. The first one is a primary composite outcome which was ESRD and doubling of the serum creatinine, there's definitely a difference between the placebo and the canagliflozin. The renal-specific outcomes was also better in terms of uh, canagliflozin, intestinal disease, kidney transplantation, death from cardiovascular disease, and death from any cause. So this was showing you that um, the SGLT2 inhibitors are going to be uh, better. There was a re risk reduction by almost by 30%, and that was not, uh, and it was pretty impressive. Then came the DAPA CKD trial, and the DAPA CKD trial had 4,000 patients, and they used DAPA glyphlose in 10 milligrams, both diabetics, which was 67, and non diabetics in 37%. And they had a primary endpoint of like uh, sustained 50% or more decline in the GFR or ESRD. Everywhere it shows that it was actually better. So, primary endpoint, renal specific endpoints, or composite death from the uh, cardiovascular causes or uh, hospitalization or heart failure and death from it. So this was becoming more and more significant. So not only are you able to save the kidneys, you're also able to retard the progression, delay the dialysis, but also going to give you a mortality benefit, survival benefit. And the last one which came was our EMPA kidney in which the earlier ones were like uh, 25 and 30, but now in this, the GFR was 20 to 45. ACR was more than 200. They use empagliflozin 10 or placebo. Both had, this was the largest trial with 6,600 patients, diabetes and non-diabetes. Again, it showed that there was a benefit uh, in terms of progression of the CKD, as well as the death from the cardiovascular disease, both were beneficial. So now, what does this trials tell you? That in case if you have a diabetic patient, use canagliflozin. If you have a non-diabetic patient, you can use empagliflozin and dapagliflozin. Obviously, you can use this for diabetes as well. So there are a few, few certain caveats that you should be avoiding. So always avoid use in patients with genital infections, ketoacidosis, lupus, and polycystic kidneys. There's no data in this population that's why. This is the dose that you would like to use, canagliflozin 100, dapagliflozin 10, or empagliflozin 10. And stop during the period of illness as we do for the RAS blockers. Stop during perioperative period, maintain foot care. So that this is only came because of the can canagliflozin, which had an increased risk of amputation. Now, again, canagliflozin increased risk of amputation, which came in the first study, 
was only for the level of the uh, uh, digits and the metadata, so not the entire foot. So just to mind you. Uh, what to anticipate? There, there will be attitude to drop in GFR, but that will be maintained. But if it drops more than 30, then you have to withdraw it. Now, place four. A 75-year-old male with diabetes, hypertension, BPH, and mild kidney disease presented with feeling unwell for last few months, weight loss, aches, and pains. He mentions that his urine stream is slow, but is present for a long time. He has tried taking acetaminophen and he is now taking ibuprofen. He is on furosemide, ramipril, metformin. He presented to his family doctor and was found to have a creatine of 270. Six months back, the creatine was 130. Hemoglobin was 100. White blood cells was 4.5. Sodium was 140. Potassium was 5. Chloride was 110. Bicarb was 20. Calcium was 2.65. Phosphate was 1.2. Albumin was 30, but the protein was 80. And the UNSC showed no blood, one plus proteinuria. You diagnose him with having acute oncogenic kidney disease. Now, what are the possible causes of acute oncogenic kidney disease in this patient? I'll give you a few seconds. Okay. So I just wanted to make this, uh, present this. A on C is quite common. We see this all the time. How do you approach a patient with A on C is where I wanted to uh, take you guys. However, this patient has got multiple reasons on A on C. That's because his probably has decreased PO intake, he has weight loss, aches and pains, and then he has this albumin and creatine reversal. So maybe if he's having myeloma, his anion gap was, as you can see, like was uh, only 10, which is normal anion gap, but he was uh, having high anion gap, a uh, normal anion gap, and a reversal. So it points to myeloma. And in the myeloma, you want to see uh, the calcium, which was elevated, adrenal failure, anemia, and uh, bone disease. But he's also taking ibuprofen and he also has a post renal kind of stuff because he's a uh, urine stream or slow. So basically, you've got all the reasons for acute and chronic kidney disease. And how do you approach this? So, any thoughts is basically that. Basically, you do the same thing as what you do for any patient for AKI. Pre renal is you think of intravascular depletion, reduced cardiac output, hypertension, renovascular, hypertension, uh, renovascular disease. If you've got any renal interstitial nephritis, toxins like uh, myeloma, or endogenous toxins or exogenous like NSAIDs, GN or poorly controlled hypertension, post renal urosepsis. So basically for any A1C, just go by the evaluation for AKI. You will find out the cause, try to fix the cause, and you should try to hope that the clearing comes down to so its baseline. Case number five is a patient, 58 female with history of CKD, secondary to diabetes, GFR of 25, ACR of 220 presents for clinic visit. You see that the potassium is 6. In the past, potassium used to be in the range of 5.2 to 5.5. Now, uh, it is 6. She's on candace certain, which was not recent, but has been taking for a long period of time. She's on fluorosmine, glucosin, and insulin. Now, what are the causes of hyperkalemia in this patient, and how will you manage? So, as you can see, the potassium of 6 is definitely hyperkalemic. It's not like 5.5, should I think or not, but definitely this is hyperkalemic. What are the reasons here? The reasons are because she's a diabetic, right? Diabetics are non, uh, they have a hyporenemic hypoaldosteronism, so they have less aldo effect to cause potassium excretion. Her GFR is down, so she's probably retaining the potassium. Then she is on candesartan. What I didn't, uh, there's no post renal cause. So these are all the reasons. But what we don't realize is whether the patient is taking high potassium diets. So the approach and how do you do it? How do you manage it? The risk factors are, as we mentioned, is CKD, diabetes. If the patient has decongested heart failure, medications, there's a whole list, but they're actually easy to remember. If you've got ROS blockers, if you've got uh, aldosterone blockers, or um, uh, aldosterone uh, released from the medications or the aldosterone receptor blockers, or you have other ones which are like amyloride, uh, time treating, time treating. Do not forget, forget the potassium supplements and do not forget the heparin. Intravenous heparin can also cause hyperkalemia. So how do you manage this patient? Always remember to know what is the EGFR. If this patient's EGFR is say 40, 50, you know that you're having a lot of, you have a lot of room to get the potassium out. You don't have to worry. But however, if the GFR is like say, 13, 14, it's going to be terrible. This can be all the medications which are not essential, like NSAIDs, COX-2 inhibitors, or herbal medications. Advice for a low potassium diet. Now, we all know what is a low potassium diet, but the common culprits are potatoes and tomatoes. That is one thing that the patient may, it may be their staple diet, but they had to discontinue it. 
Sometimes if you get a high pro, uh, potassium in the fruits as well, patients may like to take juices. They may have to uh, take uh, uh, less of that. Juices are worst. Why? Because they are like total, like uh, the fruit juices from multiple fruits as compared to only one fruit when you eat one fruit. Diuretic therapy. You may use a thiazide or a loop diuretic. Sometimes you may have to use a double, depending on how much is the volume status. If the patient has acidosis, as I mentioned, you start the patient on sodium bicarbonate. The target sodium bicarbonate, uh, target bicarbonate should be 22 or more. And if you still need to, and if you want to continue the RAS blockers, we want, because that's the only thing that has been shown to be beneficial for the patients. You may want to check the potassium after you do the above changes, make sure that the potassium is less. If the potassium is more than 5.5, either decrease the dose of RAS blockers or discontinue spinalactone or use potassium binders, which is spatarimer or zirconium. Uh, nowadays, we are not using the sodium polystyrene because of the uh, reports of intestinal necrosis, but we are having petirumor as a we will try to use that. Uh, I, I hope we have some time for the case. Lloyd, is it okay to go ahead or you want to stop yeah, here? Yeah, can finish it. Yes. Okay. Uh, a 58 year old female with CK, uh, CKD, secondary to diabetic nephropathy, EGF is 25. You present to your clinic for follow up. You see that the hemoglobin is 104. MCV is 78, transferrin saturation 0 0.2, ferritin is 100. How will you manage her anemia? So what are the four options that we gave her as start her on Roxadusat, your iron, either IV or oral, start her on erythropoietin stimulating agents like Eprex or uh, Darbipoietin, or give a Paxil transferrin. Obviously, we are not going to do this okay, unless the patient's hemoglobin is less than 70. There is, there is one evidence for this on non-dialysis population, but not routinely available. So we are left out with these two, uh, uh, two options. Now, as you know, how do you get anemia and CKD? It's basically because uh, let's, there can be a deficiency of EPO because there's a lot of pathway which inside happens inside the kidneys, which will cause EPO deficiency. Okay? And EPO, as you know, causes erythropoiesis. What is when does this happen in males or females? You feel if you see this graph will show you that this is for the males and this is for the females. As the GFR goes below 60, the hemoglobin starts coming down. As the GFR goes below 60, the hemoglobin starts going down. So whether it's a male or a female, when the GFR starts below 60, the hemoglobin starts coming down, more so when it is less than 30. So you start getting anemia effects after 30, when you're in stage four. So what is the effects of anemia? You get reduced quality of life, increased cardiovascular disease, Increase hospitalizations, uh, cognitive impairment, and mortality, both in dialysis and non-dialysis, and loss, longer hospital stay. And what are the mechanisms? You get EPO deficiency, iron deficiency. You get a lot of inhibitors of the erythropoiesis, shortened RBC survival in patients who are on dialysis, nutritional deficiencies like folate, B12, anorexia, dialysis loss. As you can see, we have got also a new exciting thing, which is hepcidin. Hepcidin is something which does not allow the body to absorb the iron, in, especially the patient with CKD. Okay? Hepcidin is made in the liver and it is not broken down properly in patients with renal failure. So there's a reduced renal clearance of hepcidin and it causes all sorts of problems by iron absorption and then transportation of the iron. So, sorry for the small slide. Uh, this is about the management of anemia and CKD. How do you manage it? It's essentially the same as would, what any internist would do. The basic test is basically don't label everything on EPO. You have to go through the basic steps of typing the anemia, anemia as what is, is the cause. Like you have to get the iron stores, B12, and if you are, if the patient has folate deficiency. If the patient is iron deplete, give the iron first because there's no point in jumping to the ESA if the iron is depleted. Okay. Obviously, you have to make sure that the patient is not having any hemoglobin pathy like sickle cell disease or thalassemia, or the patient is not losing the blood from anywhere. Okay. And then, once you're done done all the prelim test, you do your EPO then. So, you have to evaluate anemia. As per KDGO, at least you have three months when the patient is in stage 3 to 5, and uh, at least monthly when you're in stage 5. And investigations that are done are basically absolute recount, CBC, ferritin, uh, transparent saturation, B12, and folate levels. Now, the levels for iron deficiency that I follow is if the saturation level is less than 0 0.2, that is 20%, or ferritin less than 200, 
Does that mean that a patient with a ferritin, high ferritin, does not have iron deficiency? I usually look at the transferrin saturation to tell me a better answer. Now, ferritin can be raised because of many reasons. That's why I look at the transferrin saturation. So treatment of anemia and CKD is you get all these things like iron is oral or IV. You can get erythropoietin stimulating agents, which is EPO, darbipoietin, or mitral. Uh, this is nothing but sera, which we are not using in this part of in Americas. HIF inhibitors are not like there's no, uh, they are not been marketed so far. I but I think one of the countries has a HIF inhibitors FDA approved. The oral iron, as you, these are the oral and the intravenous ions as we see. The most commonest and the most cheapest that we use is ferrous sulfate because each tablet will have 65 milligrams and that is the better one absorbed as well as compared to the other ones which are expensive but less absorbed. Nowadays, we are going away from the iron dextran from the intravenous, but what we are using is iron isomaltose. One time we give one gram and that's it. And that should, should be good enough. Coming to the EPO, there are a few landmark trials in anemia and CKD, but for patients who are on, these are both for dialysis and non-dialysis, but for our patients, we have got the CREATE and the CHOIR trial. Again, this were like uh, targeting a hemoglobin between 13 to 15 versus uh, uh, 11, 10, uh, 10 to 11. Of over three years and what it showed what it was associated with um, uh, headaches but again uh, choir trial was in non-diabetes uh, non-dialysis patient uh, again hemoglobin of 13.5 versus 11 and what happened was with higher hemoglobin was associated with death migraine infarction heart failure hospitalization and stroke that's why we are not using our uh, target as uh, 13 but 11 Again, this is a non-dialysis population, so stage three, four, five. Treat was the most that uh, came in 2009. Again, it showed that it was the largest trial of 4,000 patients and the target hemoglobin was 13 with darbipotin. What it showed was there was no incidence of renal failure, increased incidence of renal failure or heart failure, but it showed an increased risk of stroke. So again, we are going back to our hemoglobin of 10 to 1, 11.5, uh, that is 100 to 115. Agents available, as I mentioned, Usually we start the agents when the hemoglobin goes below 100, not when the uh, hemoglobin is above 100. In our lady, this patient who was having 104, I won't start the EPO, but I'd like to give her only oral ions. The causes of EPO hyporesponse is if you have got iron deficiency, that's the most important, or infection, inadequate or uh, under dialysis, or you've got a bleeding patient, hyperpyrrhythmia malignancy. So basically this is all our uh, nothing like a rocket science, it's all our basics uh, learning that we rule out when there's a EPO hypo resistance. So in this case, it was give her oral iron. This is the last case, but I think I'll stop because it's already over time. I, I can open, like, uh, if you have any questions. Uh, Patrick uh, Bilikundi had asked, uh, explain the transient increase in the GFR in 90% as displayed in the computer. That was because of that, as, as I mentioned, there was a few patients, yeah. with the, the, as it was a statistical thing. It's not like something that we will always say that blip is there. Yeah. How does CCB decrease the proteinuria? I believe the CCB is decrease the proteinuria by causing vasodilatation and actually decreases the glomerular uh, uh, perfusion. And that's why it's the same thing that you get uh, there. But it's very surprising to find out that the non-dihydropyridines, which is a verapamil and diltiazem, they have a bigger effect on antiproteinuric effect as compared to our normal dihydropyridines, which is the amlodipine and nephedipine. Again, the mechanisms, I think, is vasodilation, less glomerular filtration is why it causes. How do you justify stage 1 and stage 2 CKD being considered as CKD with EGFR greater than 16? So as I mentioned, CKD, the traditional definition used to be less than 60. However, we also found that the patients with diabetes who may have uh, uh, micro, microalbuminuria or hyperfiltration, the GFR is going to be very high, like 90, 100, but they have structural damage to the kidney. Now, the structural damage to the kidney is in the microscope. So they will have structural damage, and that's why And if the damage persists for more than uh, three months, you still label them as CKD. So even the GFR, like this in 60, uh, greater than 60, you will still call them as chronic kidney disease. As I mentioned, it's structural and functional abnormality. Do ESRD patients develop AKI? Now, again, this is like um, the play of the words, right? What is AKI? If you have an increase in the creatine, which is more than 30%, or if you have got drop in the GFR, say, more than 30%. So if a patient has a, a GFR of like 12 and he comes with a GFR of 4, obviously there's an acute on chronic kidney disease. But they, yeah, you can say, you can label it if you want to label it as that way.
is there a difference between different type of asymmetries or CKD? Um, there are studies which show, try to compare uh, captopril, enalapril, uh, ramipril, and uh, perindopril, but uh, there are studies which, uh, like in kidney transplant, you can have quinopril or fosinopril as well. For us, it's, I think it's more of the uh, class effect rather than the individual medication. The, cl the class is important to be there rather than any of the specific medication to be there. I, there might be a few uh, differences, but I would say that more of the, you should have the patient on that RAS blocker than any other choice. Now, whether you want to give a RAS, uh, A centimeters or ARB, again, depends on what, uh, what the patient tolerates. Like for example, the A centimeters, if they have cough or the other stuff, you don't want to use uh, A centimeters, but you use um, the ARB. Again, if you have a uh, angioedema, Definitely, you can't use either. So, why is a diastolic blood pressure not considered in blood pressure target KDGO 2021? It's because of the sprint trial. The sprint trial was uh, the systolic less than 120, and that they didn't uh, have the diastolic the target. That's why. It's again, if you look, look into the sprint trial, it's one of the like um, uh, uh, statistical things that they found out, and that in that the diastolic was not a part of it. That's why it's uh, not a part of the KDGO. Was it appropriate to initiate diuretics for case two? And as the patient was edematous, was it appropriate to uh, continue in the calcium? Absolutely. Amlodipine is not the correct thing. Uh, Amlodipine can cause uh, edema. And we see that all the time. You're absolutely correct. But however, um, you can start the patient on diuretics as well because of that. But uh, the patient had the blood pressure which has to be controlled. That's why when you want to stop the amlodipine, you have to be careful. Now, there have been studies of what you can do and uh, what uh, whether you want to increase the dose of the same antihypertensive medication or you want to add on. Basically, the newer studies and newer evidence has come that adding a new new agent to the already uh, existing antihypertensive medications is actually better blood pressure control than just increasing the medication. I'm not sure whether I, I actually don't uh, remember what was the case too, but I can go back and this to and find out. Aspirin and CKD, what is the evidence out there in our guidance? Uh, show one. Why do we rely so much of GFR in diabetes uh, patient than serum creatine in assessment of CKD progression? Okay, aspirin and CKD. Now, as per the new trial, as, uh, as you know, aspirin has been shown to have increased bleeding, but not much of benefit. It was modest benefit at all. So we are not actually prescribing as, uh, aspirin to any of the uh, diabetics or non-diabetics patient. Uh, if they don't have any coronary disease. So same hold true. I don't use, uh, I or my colleagues here don't use aspirin at all. If the patient, we use only aspirin if the patient has a documented uh, uh, coronary disease or a stroke. Otherwise, we won't use aspirin. There's no evidence there. Why do we rely much on GFR in diabetes patient than serum creatinine in, in assessment of uh, CKD progression? It's, again, uh, creatinine has its own caveats. I, um, GFR is hyperfiltration in diabetes. It's actually not a great mark of kidney damage because patients with diabetes will always have hyperfiltration. I don't know whether I can understand that question, but um, you can you can speak up if you uh, want to explain to me. Then should EPO use always be prescribed IV iron or can be used in the uh, oh. If you have a ferritin which is more than 500 or you have a transferrin saturation which is more than 0 0.2, 0 0.25, then you do you need only to do EPO. You don't need to give IV iron. Now, if you started EPO and after some time you've seen that the iron saturation has fallen down, that means the patient has developed a functional iron deficiency because all the iron has been used up and that time you want to give IV iron. So the answer is you can give EPOs independently of IV iron if you are very sure that there is no iron deficiency. The, people, the patient will develop iron deficiency after starting EPO because the iron is used up. Then how should we follow up the patient with high GFR more than 100? So basically you don't do anything, but you just tell the patients, make sure that you are don't gain more weight, do not take more salt, and you know if the patient has any albuminuria or proteinuria, then start the patient on the RAS blockers or RAS inhibitors because that's really going to help you. Nothing else. Like I see this uh, eGFR more than 100 in two categories. One is uh, three categories, basically. One is diabetes patients, obesity patients, and then sickle cell disease. I got a lot of sickle cell disease patients in my practice uh, because I'm kind of like a, a 
I get all those from our blood clinics. And uh, sickle cell or thalassemias are hyperfiltration patients. And also that's why their creatinine always stays like 50 or 60. And uh, the protein is like three grams. So I just start them on the RAS, or, uh, RAS blockers also. Whether it benefits or not, no evidence. But whatever it is, if it is a proteinuric disease, I will use it. Any benefit of SGLT2 inhibitors in non proteinic uh, CKD? Yes. So that is a uh, very good question. Thank you. Uh, SGLT2 inhibitor has been traditionally now has informed there's a good foundation for proteinuric CKD, but there are ongoing trials which have been showing that it is also benefit for patients with uh, non proteinic CKD. Now, the biggest um, uh, example is patients from the cardiovascular disease in which there were some benefit, but a non proteinic CKD as a primary population, now there are ongoing trials, and I think the trials will be out within a, this year or next year to show that there's an evidence. Does topical NSAIDs cause AKI? Couldn't they be an alternative to oral NSAIDs to patients who? Yes, you can. You can use it. The topical administration is uh, absorption of NSAIDs is quite less. Uh, the uh, the amount of uh, NSAIDs that are used also one point one six percent in diclofenac. I usually will if the patient is using it and they don't use anything else. I'll ask them to continue to using it, but I'll tell them that don't use too much. Whether they cause AKI, mm, I don't know. I have not encountered that. In the event you have normal iron indices or high, if one one oral iron supplies, but persistently low hemoglobin, is it justifiable to give? Yes, it is justifiable to give uh, etoalone. In my setting, it's very hard to get erythropoietin levels. We do not do erythropoietin levels here either. The utility is like next to none. The only place where you want to get the erythropoietin levels is if you are having erythrocytosis, which is exactly the opposite of what we have. So you can start EPO, but just make sure that you are not dealing with B12 deficiency. The patient is not losing or uh, any uh, having any helminths uh, problems. Great presentation. Is there a difference between empagliflozin 10 and 25? Yes, there is a present difference between empagliflozin 10 and 25. So all the studies for kidneys have been done with 10 and all the studies for diabetes are with 25. So uh, if you want to go for sugar control, go for 25. If you want to go for only the class effect, 10 is good enough. Is there a difference between dapagliflozin and empagliflozin? Nothing as per me. I use whatever comes to my mind, I'll use it. But depends on what uh, the endocrinologist. I usually touch base with the endocrinologist. So whatever they want, I'll say yes to that. For patients with ESRD on uh, dialysis, are you allowed to use NSAIDs? Depends on what this is. Now, NSAIDs, you can say that if the patient is anuric or is not making urine, why don't we use it? Yes, you can use it. But the thing is, NSAIDs will cause gastritis, GI bleed, strokes, heart failure, everything else can also be. So again, if needed, I'll use it, like push to the wall, like, like that's the last thing that the patient wants and he feels better. Yes, use it, but also tell the, explain the risk to the patient that you can have GI bleed and all. In one case, which was presented, a diabetic patient was on hydrochlorothiazide. Why thiazides in diabetes? As they worsen the high... Yes, uh, very good question. Thiazides are known to cause hyperglycemia, but the the benefit of thiazides has been more than only that. Thiazides have other side effects as well, like hyperuricemia, hyponatremia, but the amount of uh, nitriuresis that they give is quite well as compared to the loop diuretics. And as you know that uh, the all heart trial and other uh, uh, trials, they started using thiazides. So that's why the thiazides have been used very commonly. Nowadays, we are using long-acting thiazides like chlorothalidone, not like uh, and uh, chlorothalidone and indepamide, and we are trying to shift away from hydrochlorothiazide. Alicia is asking, aspirin is NSAID as other NSAIDs. Doesn't it close for it? See, the, the dose of the aspirin is a uh, baby dose, 80, 81 milligrams. So 81 milligrams is good enough to prevent that um, platelet inhibition by inhibiting that, uh, uh, the pathways. What we use as an uh, analgesic is 325 milligrams, two tablets for every six hours or four. That's a huge dose as an anti-inflammatory. So that can cause AK. The 81 of aspirin does not cause any much of uh, damage. Comment on ascorbic acid in CKD. As far as possible, I try to avoid it. The reason is because ascorbic acid, once you start taking it, it uh, metabolizes to form oxalate and that has been shown to cause deposition. CKD is as such going to ca cause ascorbic uh, oxalate, uh, oxalate retention and you don't want to damage that uh, tubular interstitium further. That's why I try to avoid using ascorbic acid. Now, what is the dose? People take 500 milligrams. I had a patient who was taking four grams of ascorbic acid because he didn't want to take it vaccines against the COVID. And he ended up having renal failure in one year by, and we did a biopsy and it was all about oxalate crystals in the kidney. So that's why I don't try to use ascorbic.
uh, with your gout or stones, you advise us to use all uh, uh, Yes, now with the allopurinol, and then there was a uh, trial about a fibroxystat. I think it, the, I forget the name. The fibroxystat is a good drug. It brings on the levels fast, but there was a cardiovascular events with that. That's why we are not using the fibroxystat as, as much as what you used to use about uh, 10 years back. We are using allopurinol because that's, we know there are a lot of side effects, but we are using that. Patient with high risk. Uh, see, there are guidelines of when to use allopurinol. So when are you using the allopurinol? If you have got more than three attacks of gout in a year, or you have uh, recurrent uric acid stones, or you got gouty tofa, uh, then you use the allopurinol. Otherwise, one attack of gout or one attack of stones, you are not going to use allopurinol. Any role of keto analogs in the CKD? There's no role of keto analogs in the CKD. Those are very expensive medications. They are really not shown to have any benefit as such. Thank you for the detail. Can kindly word on Clotho supplement in CKD or uh, risk factor. Clotho sounds very interesting. It's very intriguing. But still, I, when I was a, a nephrology fellow 15 years back, we have been reading a lot about Clotho. That's the time when the Clotho started coming. But still, it is not yet out. Like commercially, you can get Clotho uh, some for boutiques, but nothing from the CKD. Uh, it sounds very interesting, but comment on GI disturbances in CKD patients with probiotics in the setting of many drugs are usually on. Uh, there's a whole lot of chapter about GI disturbance in CKD patients. I um, I haven't, uh, we didn't have time to read about this. Regarding the probiotics, probiotics, you have to be careful about it. Why? Because you don't know which patient uh, may or may not benefit on it. Probiotics as such very expensive. If you go to a naturopath, they'll always tell you to take it. But uh, there's something also, also gut dialysis in which they will take a lot of uh, bacteria and uh, it cause dialysis in which uh, you don't want to do hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis. So that's where I would say, but otherwise we don't use it here. Use of Oxenbeck in Cidivic has any benefit? Yes, it has. Uh, it has a lot of benefit. In fact, it has been shown to slow the rate of uh, retardation and also as a proteinuric, um, uh, antiproteinuric uh, effect. That's why uh, there is a role of Oxenbeck in the CKD. Also, if you can lose more weight, why not? Because that is actually what we need. Remember that uh, example that I told you, the, the strain on the kidney with weight loss is better. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. It was a phenomenal topic. And uh, I think a lot of questions, a lot of people were very happy with it. And I think uh, wonderful. Uh, extensively covered, extensively covered here. Yeah. I'll just tell you that it's basically uh, 56 male. With, uh, basically, what I'm trying to show here is how bad is the NBD? So like if you yeah. go here, like yeah. uh, 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 the whole thing was about this, uh, about MBD. And uh, I was going to talk about lab, bone and uh, vascular, about the pathophysiology, parathyroid abnormalities, and what causes this medial calcification. This medial calcification is the worst of all. Okay, so that's why. And what are the consequences of security MBD? And so our answer is basically it contributes to the systolic hypertension, is positive velocity and contributes to the heart failure and cardiac myopathy. Thank you very much. It was wonderful. Uh, nice questions. Thank you for the questions. It was great.